Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Wolverine number 35, cover dated January 1991. And this is part one of a three-part storyline entitled Blood and Claws. And obviously from this cover it features Lady Deathstrike and Puck from Alpha Flight. So I really like this cover. It is incredibly dynamic and exciting looking and the warm oranges and yellows of the Australian Outback bursting into wherever this is supposed to be set um, really works effectively, I feel. The artist, of course, is Mark Silvestri and inked by Dan Green. So let's open this one up to the first page and we do get a splash page to begin with. And we have the title there of this particular chapter of the three-part storyline, Blood, Sand and Claws. There's a little coloring error there. There is a comma there, but it hasn't been colored in yellow. And the setting is Vancouver, British Columbia. So in the previous issue, uh, Logan is in Canada. He's gone back to his roots. And the further details concerning this location are that it's not a particularly ritzy part of town. But hey, I'm not a particularly ritzy kind of guy. So it's Logan's first person narration. Here he is watching this particular uh, biker called Freight, uh, Freight Train uh, thrown out of this uh, bar. And I like the way that uh, Silvestri has indicated Logan's head and his hat there by the cigar smoke billowing around him. And this is an interesting uh, device of Silvestri's as well. When someone hits the ground, he just draws straight across it's um, a very effective little trick for indicating someone who's face flat on the ground. And um, yeah, the details of the bikes there as well. Uh, good command of machinery from Silvestri, of course. One other detail I wanna point out, and I pointed out in previous videos, is whether Silvestri or not is using a ruler to grid out the perspective here and draw it in. Dan Green on the inks is not using a ruler when he's inking these straight lines. So there's little wobbles there with his brush inking and it gives everything a more organic feel, which I really like. So the creative team is Larry Hama script, Mark Silvestri pencils, Dan Green inks, Pat Brousseau lettering and Glynis Oliver on colors. Let's continue with the story. So it turns out that the bouncer who's uh, tr thrown out that biker is Eugene Judd um, of Alpha Flight. And I like this little uh, piece of dialogue between Logan and uh, Puck here. Nice toss, been working on that upper body strength, have you Puck? They call me Judd around here. What are you calling yourself these days? Logan will do. Wolverine keeping a low profile, is he? Some. So um, I like that kind of laconic dialogue between the pair. So the biker heads off there. We'll see him a little bit later. And then we get a nice interior shot of this gas town bar and lots of details here. I like the uh, kind of grimy effect of the locale and the customers that Silvestri creates in the art. So in they come and the regular bouncer here uh, Bambi Bolinski, that's a very memorable name, is has a bandaged arm and that's why Judd is filling in. So he says here, meet the regular bouncer of this fine establishment, Ms. Bambi Bolinski, presently indisposed with multiple fractures. And Logan says here, let me guess, you should have seen the other five guys, more like eight, she says. Pull up a pew and join the game. Ever play Split the Fly. So this is the kind of typical stuff you get in Larry Hama's our run on Wolverine, all these little slice of life and um, characteristically uh, uh, macho and tough guy uh, little encounters. They're kind of for me thinking about it when I was, as I was rereading this issue in preparation for making the commentary video is it reminds me a little bit of Tarantino or rather the influence would be going the other way um, in terms of these little moments of uh, macho uh, competition. So Bambi Belinsky, who I would say is um, a lesbian, let's say, um, she spits here on the table, puts some sugar out over her spit, that attracts the fly, and then she splits the fly with her knife there. And then she uh, offers Logan to play the game, two pieces, but off center. I'll take a clean split, dead center to beat it. 
So Logan here says, we play this game a bit different where I come from, little darling. And then we get a little uh, scene shift to Osaka, Japan. And this calls back to the previous three-part storyline and in particular issue 33. Um, so it's the residence of Daikumo, the deceased Daikumo. The cops are pulling up here, uh, keeping an eye on the deserted residence and they catch in the headlights who is a familiar figure for long time readers, it's Lady Deathstrike, but they don't know that. And one of the uh, cops says, like a ghost in ancient armor, I like that um, phrasing. So one of them gets out of uh, the car, Akira. Meanwhile, the other one pulls up a file on Daikumo and the murders at the residence. And we see that Lady Deathstrike is putting together that Wolverine was there, that he tore himself out of the stainless steel tank with his adamantium claws just like mine, she thinks to herself. And of course, longtime readers know that Lady Deathstrike has a debt of honor that she uh, believes she owes her father and um, her family. And she is determined to hunt down and kill Logan or Wolverine in order to uh, fulfill that um, honor debt. So Akira here, unlucky Akira, uh, catches up on Lady Deathstrike tells her to put her hands up and turn around slowly. And um, this is interesting because I was thinking about this as I was rereading and I was thinking, why does she even bother with this guy? But for her, honor is a paramount concern. So she is disgusted at this guy giving her orders. You dare to give orders to Lady Deathstrike. And he retorts, who? Look, I don't care if you're Astro Boy's little sister, so a manga reference there. I said to put your, or rather, um, an anime reference. I said to put your hands, um, anime and manga, I think, Astro Boy. You, uh, you want my hands, lowborn dog, she says, and then she skewers him with those adamantium uh, fingers, fingers and nails of hers. So that's a gruesome debt for Akira. Meanwhile, his partner, Tetsuo, is out in the cop car. We see the shadow cast by Lady Deathstrike's strikes hands there again, and he's a dead man as he screams there. Great lighting as well on these pages. And remember, as I said earlier, um, all of this brush inked by Dan Green, incredibly uh, sure inking from Dan Green. Then we're back in, Dan in Vancouver, and we're picking up with that split the fly game, that macho game. So Wolverine here uh, upping the stakes, or rather, uh, yeah, ratcheting up uh, the stakes of the game by pouring the sugar out on his um, forearm. In comes a freight train and two mates. I love the details of like one of them's got a chainsaw and the other guy's got a shovel. He's got a crowbar. I love, yeah, I love the detail too of his belly sticking out there under his uh, t-shirt. And here we go. So uh, Judd is amused by uh, how Logan is playing the game. And Bambi here uh, saying in the background, oh, I get this dodge. It's finesse, right? He's so good, he can split the fly and not even nick himself. And Judd says, no, Bambi dear, finesse is not a quality one associates with Logan. So here we go. I like the transition from panel to panel here where he's got the knife raised and down it goes thunk. So we know it's gone right into his forearm. And the lads in the background, you just see how crestfallen and how aghast they are at this guy, this crazy guy who'd be prepared to knife his own arm. And so that completely uh, disarms them. They turn around and comically they flee uh, the bar there. And um, yeah, Silvestri, this reminds me, this particular panel, that Silvestri is very good with cartooning and like little comic beats as well, going all the way back to his um, Uncanny X-Men run with Chris Claremont. He was very good at that and he's doing it here to great effect in this particular uh, little sequence as well. So now where's the story going? Well, we go back to Osaka. Here's poor Tetsuo, he's dead, he's falling out the side of the car. And meanwhile, Lady Deathstrike is accessing their um, in-car computer files. So that was established earlier and now she's accessing, remember Lady Deathstrike is a cyborg. Um, she has been um, worked on by Spiral and uh, transformed in order to uh, hunt down Logan and kill him in order to make good on that debt of honor. But I really like this characterization and this kind of sails close to the edge of what's implied here by Lady Deathstrike in her um, commentary on her um, experience of the data flowing in through her eye there, the wiring into her eyes. So she says here, 
data flow warm exciting pleasurable almost like dot you know dash dash and so there's an implication there that for her in her cyborg state in this transformed state that the data flow is like sex to her um, it's like erotic pleasure to her so it really gives a sense of how um, transformed she is and the degree to which she's lost her humanity something that was um, explored in wounded wolf uncanny x-men 205 and interesting then that her prey is wolverine who battles with the beast within him and is determined always to see that his humanity comes out on top where she sacrificed her humanity in order to hunt him down so she gets the information on what happened in those previous issues um, about Logan's corpse being brought to Japan. Um, he was playing dead, playing possum. He was drugged um, so that it appeared like he was dead by Tiger Tiger. And now Donald Pierce calls in and, and asks her, did you find him? So she says, I found the beginnings of a trail, Pierce. Teleport me, make gateway bring. And so she's teleporting away back, back to the outback, back to the Reaver's town in the Australian outback. So um, around this time, Uncanny X-Men 269, when Rogue finally appeared out the other side of the Siege Perilous, which she went through in Uncanny X-Men 247, when she finally came out the other side, she reappeared back in that outback town. But at that point, uh, the outback town had been retaken by the Reavers after the X-Men went through the Siege Perilous in Uncanny X-Men uh, 249. So here we go. So they're back in possession of the town. We have an interesting little piece of dialogue here uh, between Pierce and Lady Deathstrike. So Pierce says um, regarding uh, her proposal to go to Madripoor to follow up on what she learned from those files. Pierce says, that snake pit, you tempt fate, Eureka. That place is dangerous even to the likes of us. But she is determined. So she says, I will have him, Pierce, send me. And he responds, you make me strain the limits of the gaze, milady. You should not forget that while Gateway is under obligation to us, he is not warmly disposed to our aims. And that which is done under duress is of questionable quality and sincerity. So that's a nice little um, foreshadowing of what happens later in the issue with Gateway. And you can see on his face that he is indeed not at all pleased to be helping them in their nefarious endeavors. But that's a great panel there. Great double lighting on Gateway's face. Main lighting here from his bull roarer. And here on the other side, also this uh, rim lighting. Great coloring too by um, Glynis Oliver. So... Donald Pierce tells Gateway, send her where she wants to go, Gateway. It is my will. So she's off to Madripoor. And here we pick up in Hightown, Madripoor. So remember, Madripoor has a high town, uptown, and a low town down by the docks. So here's Tiger Tiger looking particularly fetching in her cocktail dress, playing um, at uh, craps uh, here at the gambling table. And who arrives in to the casino except for Lady Deathstrike? And she's looking for the locations of Wolverine, aka Logan, aka Patch. You'll tell me where he is. So Tiger Tiger's in complete control of her emotions here. She says, I think not. Matra D Day, some cheap tart. I love this dialogue from Sylvester, not Sylvester, Hama rather. Um, some cheap tart has wandered into the casino and is in violation of the dress code. Eject her. So the guy gives a little bow, as you desire, Tiger. And meanwhile, she's got these two big security goons who are about to pull their guns in order to escort Lady Deathstrike out. But she grabs this waitress who's innocently coming along with drinks, and grabs her by the throat, and the guys say, let the waitress go. But Lady Deathstrike is adamant, no, I think she shall die. Her life means nothing to me. Give me my answer. And I love the punctuation as well. Just full stops, no exclamation marks. Lady Deathstrike not working up a sweat here at all, not in any uh, fear of her life. So Tiger Tiger here says to her security guy, um, I'd call her bluff, but I suspect this is a cold one. So the guy says, okay, as soon as you give her uh, the uh, location of Patch, will shoot her so tiger pulls um this piece of paper out from beneath her dress here what's it been doing in there um, but in any case she flips it over to death strike and then death strike teleports away immediately 
that's a really great panel there as well open border panel i like the little kind of cartooning effects for death strike just popping out on the teleportation uh, wrought by gateway there and it turns out the bit of paper was a postcard a postcard from logan um, under his pseudonym of patch and look how like laconic his postcard is so it's vancouver there having a great time wish you were here that's all and she was keeping that close to her heart so a little bit of um what would we say like romantic shine um from tiger towards uh, patch there and then we're back in vancouver i really like this illustration of the six pack of beers here um just think about what it is to uh draw something like that and it's done so well and so loosely too but it's so convincing the uh, quality of the verisimilitude just works really well so it turns out that logan and judd here puck are on a little fishing uh trip there enjoying themselves drinking the beer and having a chat about well what are they chatting about they're chatting about poetry and literature so judd says uh, what did Arnold say? Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was paraphrasing Nietzsche. Yeah, literate midget, says uh, Logan. It's all in good fun, of course, these two old friends. And Judd responds here. That's a great three-quarter profile there. And, of course, with his trademark uh, cauliflower ears as well. Nice little uh, uh, physical detail distinguishing the character. So he says here, he retorts, me, illiterate. You were the one who always thought Robert Frost wrote The Fog. I get them wrinkly white-haired poets mixed up. Sandberg, right? That's Carl Sandberg. So Judd says, right. Poets and writers, like their work, can't stand them. So Judd's reading a book and he says, this guy, he was different as he holds up the book. Good writer, none of that sissy, flowery stuff. And good company too, in them old days. And what's the book that he pulls out except for Whom the Bell Tolls? And um, who was that written by? It was written by Ernest Hemingway, published in 1940. And it tells the story of one Robert Jordan, a participant in the Spanish Civil War on the Republican side. That's the communist side. Um, from The Spanish Civil War went from 1936 to 1939. So the snapshot falls out of the book. Looks like an oldie, says Logan as he reaches for it. Hey, is that you back when you had your size? So there's Judge there. A Judd, rather, and there he is as a six-foot-tall man. Handsome devil, wasn't I, he says. That's the great writer himself at the table, and there's Inez on your lap. So that's Ernest Hemingway there, and this is the, well, you got to have a beautiful woman. It's a Mark Silvestri-drawn comic. How in blazes did you know her name, says Judd? And this is something that Ham is playing around with, playing around with the mysteries of Logan's past, and since Claremont established that Logan has long lived and that he was around in World War II, in the era of World War II, if you look at Uncanny X-Men 268, which is set in 1940, Hammond must have got the idea, well, maybe Logan was involved in um, the Spanish Civil War, had some involvement in the Spanish Civil War, or at least was there, um, even if he wasn't, um, you know, like a participant in it, let's put it like that. So Wolverine is um, puzzled himself by the fact that he knows the identity of the beautiful Spanish woman. That's a poser, Judd, he says. I just looked at her and I knew who she was. Meanwhile, back in the Australian outback, Lady Deathstrike has a bone between her uh, teeth and she's determined to get Wolverine. So Vancouver, for her, is a big city and she's impatient. I can't be wandering around for weeks. There must be a way for Gateway to find Wolverine right away. And this is interesting from uh, Donald Pierce, he says, if you could compel the old Abo to do exactly what you want, we wouldn't have any problems at all. You must be indirect with the old boy. A little creativity is in order, Eureka. Send me to Vancouver, she says into his ear, gateway. Send me to the place that Wolverine gazes upon this very moment. So the question is, the, that degree of indirection, being indirect um, about uh, being sent to where Wolverine is, how is that? How is uh, Gateway going to take advantage of that for his own purposes? We'll see very shortly. So Logan just relaxing on the fishing boat, and Judd continues his questions. There were you in the north of Spain in April of 1937. That's when and where that photo was taken. I don't know. He says but I can almost see the place. 
And here, this is what she says. The place that Wolverine gazes upon this very moment. I can almost see the place. He's seeing it in his imagination slash memory. This is really good stuff from Hama. I love it, it's excellent. Great panel here, borderless again. And um, Donald Pierce makes the warning. He says, your methodology may, be just, may just be indirect enough for Eureka, but I would advise you to be more specific in the future. So we're gonna get some wordplay about past and future here. Uh, Deathstrike says, there is no future or past for me until I redeem the honor of my father's name by slaying the Gaijin known as Wolverine. So here we go, like the foreigner known as Wolverine, foreigner from the Japanese perspective. So she materializes right over their fishing boat. That's a great anchor image. She's ready to slash out Logan's guts. And he recognizes her immediately, of course, uh, because the last time that they saw each other was in the Australian Outback. The whole crucifixion business on Kanye X-Men 251 and then when Jubilee rescued him from uh, the cross and nursed him back to health and they escaped from the town but then this vortex this time vortex whips up uh, Pierce realizes what it is time vortex gateway hasn't finished you're just making a stopover so Judd here smartly says bail out Logan before the vortex takes us too but it's too late they're gone what a great page and here what a, like this is so cool. They materialize in the middle of a bullfight um, and we'll learn what town they're in very shortly too. So you can see this matador getting gored on the horns of the bull. So Silvestri, adept here at drawing a bull goring a matador. Imagine being given that in a script to draw. The man can draw anything and make it look so cool as well. So Judd's back to his um, former size as well, and Logan notes that. And Judd reckon, uh, recognizes this isn't 1990, we're back in 1937 in Spain during their civil war. Remember this bullfight. I remember this bullfight. It was like a USO show for the loyalist troops. Remember the loyalist troops, they're loyal to Republican, the Second Republic, uh, which was backed by the uh, USSR, backed by Stalin, and um, which was leftist and or communist um, in character. The rebels were the nationalists and they were led by um, General Franco, um, who later became dictator of Spain after the nationalist victory um, in 1939. So, uh, and, and one other thing to note that's important as well is that Franco was backed by fascist Italy by Mussolini and Nazi Germany by Hitler. So this is the man from the picture, it's Ernest Hemingway. And he's there telling the lads to get out of the ring. You drunken fools, this is serious stuff to these people. And here's the beautiful Inez as well. But Ernesto, Judd has told me that he's a great matador, greater even than Mayera. So uh, uh, Hemingway says Mayera's dead. Inez doesn't take much to be greater than a corpse. So Logan here says, let's go Judd. Deathstrike may be lurking behind the nearest picador. And he says, I miss my chance to pick up the cape and sword one more time. I don't know how I step back into my glory days, Logan, but I'm not about to pass this up. This is my moment, my moment of truth. That's a great panel there, another open border panel. Love the simple colors here, the red, the blue of his jeans, the brown of the bull, the matadors running away, or sorry, running away with the corpse, the picadors running away with the corpse of the matador. The bull here, you can see the, uh, the swords or the blades in his hump there as well. Yeah, what a great panel. And just the weight on Judd as he's picking up uh, the Matador's red cape there as well. The lighting too, the spotting of blacks. Yeah, so good, really, really great stuff. And here we go. Uh, Olay, a perfect Veronica. So that's the move he's pulled there. And you can just see the elegance of his movement, the bull moving too. Again, so difficult to draw that. Sylvester does such an amazing job. And uh, Logan, I love this, this is so funny, just picking the uh, booze um, out of Ernest Hemingway's hand. Mind if I take a slug from your jug, Ernesto? Help yourself, he says. That Judd isn't half bad, is he, Inez? Bad, he's magnifico, she says. Logan here enjoying the booze. I love the way that hammer in these issues just so shows Logan who has, who, you know, under Claremont has had like a very rough time in this period of continuity, like 1989, 1990, and Logan just having a better time altogether 
under Hama's uh, pen. So Inez here uh, saying, um, well, Logan here saying, don't let him hear you, darling. He's liable to get a swelled head like you, Senior Logan. How well do you know me, Inez? I ever tell you my life story? And interesting what she says here. What kind of question is that? That is an insult, no? None intended, darling, he says. So she knows his backstory, but he's not rude enough to pry it out of her. And then she continues and says, so how did you two just appear in that ring like that trapdoor? Nope, magic. You, she says. Um, but then uh, Judd has gotten the better of the bull. And now it's the crowd's decision as to whether he kills the bull or spares it. They want him to, um, to kill the bull with a final trust. But he pleads for the bull's life. He's a brave bull. I ask for his life. But the question, or rather the decision is taken out of his hands because the bull is shot to bits here by a Stuka dive bomber air raid. So we're going to learn very, very shortly where this is and what precise day it is too. Legion Condor, Nazis fleeing for the, uh, fighting for the rebels. So that's what I said earlier. Franco was backed up by uh, the Nazis. And um, Logan here ordering Judd out of the uh, out of the ring. Uh, we got to get it. We got to get out of the open. There's a full scale bombing raid going on. He shouts. So again, just look at this. Like what Silvestri can do in his art. So the amphitheater clears out, and um, we get the location of where they are. They're in Guernica, and they're there on the 26th of April because that was the day that Guernica was bombed by the Luftwaffe. And uh, there you go. And there and there's a comment from Logan as well. Sure don't look like the way Picasso painted it. And that is a reference to Picasso's Guernica that he painted in 1937, later in 1937. And that is on exhibit in Madrid, in the Queen Sophia um, Art Gallery and Museum in Madrid. I've seen it there. And um, it definitely is worth a visit and a look. But this is the day itself. And many, many civilians were killed horribly in this, um, uh, you know, like this bombing of this uh, town. So uh, Ernest here makes a reference to Pablo, Pablo Picasso. Why would he paint Guernica? He's still having a great time in Paris, hanging out with Gertie and Alice. That's Gertrude Stein and Gertrude Stein's um, lover, Alice B. Toklas. So Gertrude Stein, a lesbian. It's a little callback to Bambi earlier interesting little subtext running through this particular issue um in in that regard that kind of like what would i say like um an, an easygoing attitude uh to these kinds of things um emerging from hama's um script here i would say and also logan logan's a very live and let live kind of guy too so judd whispers to logan here and he says i remember seeing this part logan but i sure don't remember you being here and logan says i got a little whiff of that old deja vu creeping up on me. Something tells me to, the stuck is turning up here in silhouette, to watch our backs. So here he is coming for another uh, run. And this is another great macho moment where Logan asks for the pig sticker from uh, Judd. And Judd is incredulous, a sword against a stuka. You might say that this was just another way to play split the fly. So we get a payoff for that whole game from earlier in the issue as well, another open border panel. Love the lighting here too, the spotting of blacks. Such fluent storytelling from um, Silvestri. And in goes the sword and um, it uh, basically kills the pilot who flies the plane right into the steeple of this cathedral here. And what a panel this is, kaboom. And now they're running for the car. Ernest and Inez are in the car here and uh, they're right that any place other than right here is fine to make a, uh, a beeline for. And Judd here says to Logan in the back of the car, one of us must have rub rubbed a magic lamp, Logan. I've had two of my most cherished wishes come true today. So that has to be like going back to his heyday, having another chance at a bullfight, as well as getting his size back. And Logan here says, if Lady Deathstrike is mixed up in this, that magic lamp is more than is more likely to be the monkey's paw. It's the that third wish you gotta watch out for. So Ernest is driving them away, and yeah, just look at the ruins of the city, the bombing of Guernica. 
it's uh, really cool from um, Hama to uh, tie in a Wolverine story into such a time and such a uh, place. Um, clever stuff. So who's watching? Logan was right. Lady Deathstrike um, has made it there to 1937 with them. She's watching through the binoculars um, that she's taken from these dead Nazis here. And she has figured it out that this is certainly not Vancouver. I just love the transitions here, the close up on the binoculars, the pull back, and then we have her just standing there in front of the wrecked uh, Jeep and the dead Nazi uh, soldiers. And she's got a little surprise. It certainly is not, says someone. Captain Horst Schlachter, Legion Condor, acting commander of this intrepid unit of Luftwaffe Field, Gendarmerie. Don't bother introducing yourself, he says. You're obviously a Republican partisan, and you're obviously guilty of ambushing my motorized recon patrol. And as a partisan, you do not even raid a military firing squad, nicked fire. Drag her to the nearest telephone pole and hang her with a length of fencing wire. And it was a brutal war. All civil wars are brutal. And uh, the Spanish Civil War was no different from that. And that's what we're getting a little flavor of here in Larry Hama's script. But it's these poor boys. Uh, well, I don't know if you can call, uh, if you can have any sympathy for Nazis, except for the fact that they are up against Lady Deathstrike and those adamantium claws. And they are for it in the next issue. To be continued, obviously, so there we go. A little apology here for misspelling Mark Silvestri's name. That used to happen so often that they'd spell his name Mark with a K. He must have complained about it himself. So we have a little note there from shamefaced and contrite Bob Harris and Suzanne Gaffney. Some letters here about a previous letter concerning Wolverine and his character. And just one letter about Wolverine number 31, which is the first of Larry Hama and Silvestri's um, on the book. And of course, um, a letter full of praise for that particular issue. Great anchor image there as well. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Wolverine number 35. Let me know what you think of the content of this particular issue. And if you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video on YouTube. It really helps the channel. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.